physical security. We'll do a, uh, a great job of covering everything you need to cover, uh, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on this right here. Uh, there's a lot of information, just like with communication and network security, a ton of information with physical security that you absolutely could spend a whole nother class in and or uh, entire semester. And so um, we'll go through and actually put you in a position to be successful for any physical security question that you may come up and see on the exam. So let's jump right in. First and foremost, you know, the, the idea or the notion of physical security really brings to life the, the, uh, the assets that we've already identified throughout the week, right? We've, we've come together, we've figured out, hey, what assets do we have? Um, and then how can we go about protecting those assets? And so anytime we start dealing with physical security, uh, it's important for us to understand um, you know, what that looks like and why that's, that's important. You know, we've, we've talked about um, information security, we've talked about computer security, but there's a lot of things that go into to physical security that we absolutely need to, to, to cover. And um, I don't want you to think that we're not doing our due diligence. So let's jump right in and make that magic happen. So natural environment threats is, is one thing supply system threats, man-made threats, um, any type of politically motivated. Uh, you know, I think that in a, in a high level, at a high level, um, you know, if we just take a look at some of these, some natural environment threats would be things like floods, earthquakes, storms, tornadoes, fires, Right, I think that we all kind of figure that. Uh, physical security, I mean, you, we also, as CISSP, we have to take into, into account um, things like supply chain risk management or supply um, system threats. And, and that's important as well. Um, like power outages, uh, comms disruptions, any type of water, sewer, and gas, which is you know kind of our uh, one of our core businesses that we we offer. We have quite a few customers that we deal with that are that are in that space and chemicals as well, some industrial control systems. Uh, what about man-made threats? You know, somebody was mentioning Taekwondo up there. Yeah, I agree, Lucy. Um, unauthorized access, maybe opening a can of whoop ass on somebody. Whoop -ah! Right. Um, Internally, externally, off the, the unauthorized access. Uh, heaven forbid that there's a disgruntled employee. Uh, you know, errors. That's a big deal. Like people actually doing things that they shouldn't be doing or just making mistakes. Like that happens all the time. That's why we have insurance. Uh, what about some politically motivated threats and you know hacktivism, for instance, or you know different types of civil disobedience. I'm putting these into the chat windows so you can uh, have a more enriched life. But either way, right, we wanna practice the thing that we talked about, I think it was on day one, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that we talked about this on day one. We wanna practice what's called a layered defense model or defense in depth approach, even whenever we're dealing with um, physical security, we want to do layered defense as well. And so it comes into play with all the physical elements around our facility. And so it starts right at the get go with some of the facility design principles. And so as you go through and, and you're reading more about what it takes to become a CISSP and specifically, you know, jumping into the physical security components, the physical site selection process comes down to, you know, the people that I've identified, um, you know, what needs to happen within the organization 
uh, you know, what are some of the things within the organization that are meaningful for the, uh, the site selection? And then, uh, you know, what level of, of protection is required for the assets that, that we have as a company as a whole? And then, you know, for any of you risk management framework people in there, when we figure that out, like where are we, where are we doing it? Um, what protection mechanisms do we need to have? And then what's an acceptable risk level for us? Um, you know, that really comes into play in the, the laws that we talked about, the regulations that we talked about, um, any, any uh, industrial uh, compliance things that we have to, to uh, organizationally have to comply with. And so that, that idea or that notion of, uh, from a security perspective, a threat profile comes into play um, because if you think about it, like a, a government facility would have different requirements than a financial facility. A, a hospital would have a different uh, set of requirements than, you know, a financial industry. And so there's adversaries for each one of those, and some of them are, are equal across the board, but those, uh, those people, processes, the uh, procedures, the technology, the equipment uh, needed to protect our uh, organization are all different from place to place. Now, as security pro professionals and people that go out and, and may do assessments in the, in the future, um, there, that word baseline keeps coming back. You know, that in, in understanding that, hey, if, if you're a security expert, it doesn't matter what field that you're in, there's common body of knowledge that, especially when you become a CISSP, that says that you have a solid understanding of a bunch of ways that we uh, need to implement physical security. And so uh, that comes into play whenever we're dealing with the, the site selection, the facility design, um, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, of, of questions need to get asked on, you know, what we need to look for whenever we're, we're coming into that. Uh, if you've never been involved with this, then, uh, you know, it's a big deal. And usually, you know, um, some things may come into play. You know, there's a lot of different moving parts whenever you're selecting a a facility, um, you know, that a lot of them have to do with things that you can add to the facility, but not limited to uh, some of the things up here. Like, you know, if you're in, if you're right on the water in Florida, especially right now, that may be something that comes into play. Yo, hey, we, we have to deal with uh, with the hundred year flood, you know, the high water mark. Um, you know, what's the facility design? Do we need to maybe you build it in a way that uh, it can withstand a Category 5 hurricane. You know, and so those types of things, questions, um, I'm just kind of um, off the top of the dome mentioning a few things, some things to consider. And so whenever we're looking at that, we need to look at uh, you know, holistically what are some of the, the, the components that really make up the uh, – the whole for the facility. And obviously, you know, you got to probably one of the most important things is, do you, do you have enough room for everybody? I know, you know, a lot of organizations that I've lived in or that I've worked at in the past, you know, they, if you're doing well, you outgrow your space pretty quickly, right? And, and then you have to go and acquire either, you know, different office buildings. Uh, obviously, you're looking into crime and, um, you know, one thing with with uh, with Amazon is uh, they were looking for different regional hubs to, to build, right? Um, hey, where's the nearest fire department or police station? Uh, it, how many different internet service providers do you have? I know that you know in my in my community here in Huntsville, all of our um, wiring for our neighborhood that was created. Um, over 30 years ago, was all done underground, and we only have one internet service provider that goes through our community. 
And so, you know, having a, a secondary um, actual physical wire internet service provider in our community is uh, is difficult. So that's where something like Starlink would come into play. You could, you know, add add certain features to that. And I say that because you know it's a it's a hot mess whenever you're dealing with all of this stuff because if you look into it too far, um, the answer for any facility is going to be no, right? Sooner or later, you got to make some exceptions and and figure out what that acceptable risk is for some of these things. And so uh, at a high level, what are those missions needs and you know, how is it going to meet what you, what you hopefully your, your goals are? Uh, some of the things that you could uh, look into that would be uh, obviously some, some, some big ticket items as well would be the uh, utilities, you know, where are you going to store the data? Do you have heating, ventilation, and air conditioning? Um, HVAC in there, or do you have to add that? Like, is it, is it adequate enough? Uh, we talked about the uh, business continuity and doing an impact analysis, maybe even coming up with a new disaster recovery plan. Uh, and then, you know, what are some of the the regulations? Uh, is the fire marshal going to come out and tell you to shut it down? Do you are you going to have to have uh, your building be up to code, so you have to have an inspection. So these are all things to, to think about whenever you, you jump in and start to you know, have a dream. This One way to look at it is this thing that's called crime prevention through environmental design. Crime prevention through environmental design. So, you know, it, there's a bunch of different reasons why you would why you would do it, but it's, it's really, you know, a discipline that, um, you know, helps uh, really manage the people in a way that's meaningful. And so let me just, let me see if I can draw something here. So if I just draw one of the big box stores, okay, I'm going to see if I can get a little 3D. Oh gosh. All right. So that's a big box store. Um, in the parking lot of that big box store out here, that's the parking lot. Just go with me. Okay. What we might do is we have the front door here. We we might actually have a uh, some herbs that make this one way, and then uh, you know some curbs on the other side that that's supposed to be an arrow that make that go the other way, and then you know we put the islands for the parking here in the middle, right? One thing to consider here is put lighting, get silly Ben, come on. We'll put some lighting in here. And now with our, what was it? Uh, the the illumination of two foot candles, right? That's what we heard before. Now we have kind of our Venn diagram. I'm just gonna do something like that. It's gonna get sloppy. That essentially illuminates the parking lot. Um, that gives us a little bit of safety there. Um, we have, you know, turret mounted cameras up here that you know, give us 360 view all the way around the facility. Um, you know, and there's a bunch of different things. <laughs> yeah, right, Con, right, Christopher. I see you, man. Uh, but yeah, we, you know, so we we would, you know, hopefully have traffic. Yes, exactly like Walmart. Um, and they spend a ton of money, you know, trying to figure out what the right way to do this is. Uh, but, you know, they, they put bollards out in front here, like at, just using Walmart as an example, the little, uh, you know, bollards that are out in front. Um, you know, they, they may put, you know, a stop sign here to make sure that people that are walking 
out the, the front door. There's a stop sign here as well that you have to stop for pedestrians. Uh, and then as you also, yeah, you can tell that that's why I was saying that I got this, uh, uh, this Surface Pro that my last one broke, so I bought a new one. And I usually like drawing on Surface Pro rather than a mouse. Uh, but also in the store, you know, you, you put little islands in the store to try to get people to do impulse advice. And so there's a whole set of things that, you know, as people move through the store, it becomes, uh, you know, meaningful strategically where you put these things. But also whenever you're in the CPTED, like, like evaluating this, architects will look into this, but not only them, but, you know, landscape architects as well. Uh, but police officers and law enforcement, I've had police officers come through and do this training before, and, and they said that they have had training uh, in the CPTED to look for, you know, certain things like uh, broken windows, uh, are chains cut, uh, the fences have gaps, are lights out in the parking garage, and, uh, and what do we need to do to, to fix those? And so you get to a point with the CPTED that, uh, you know, you, you can put yourself in a position where you feel much more comfortable, or more importantly, your patrons feel much more comfortable uh, coming to your facility. And so, you know, this is a, uh, a discipline that is oftentimes invested uh, a ton of money into, into, you know, being able to have physical security needs met. Uh, and so, how do we do that? And, and why is that important? Well, we can implement a whole truckload of things, whole truckload of things, uh, not to be limited to the things that you see on the screen here. So uh, you will see a question that probably has man trap in it. You will see a question that probably has man trap in it. I'm just letting you know. Um, it's likely that you will see a, uh, a question that has something about fencing in it, and that's not the, the sport fencing, right? Uh, I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, you also see probably a question on that FRR, FAR that I mentioned yesterday dealing with uh, with biometrics, so uh, keep that in mind. And then uh, you probably will see a question saying something about the bollards, and these are bollards right here. Uh, did you know? Did you know? And for your fences question that you might have, that uh, check this out. You know, I've kept myself in, in decent shape over the years. Three, three to four foot fences only deter casual trespassers. Okay, so check this out. Fences that are three to four feet only deter casual trespassers. Fences six feet to seven feet high are considered too high to climb easily. Question is, do you think that if a dog was chasing you, that you could jump a three to four foot fence right now? That's the question. Uh, six to seven foot fence, it depends on how big the dog is, right? Because I might be just running through that six to seven foot fence, especially if it's uh, wooden. That'd be interesting to see if somebody got that on video. Uh, and then we have uh, this one, fences that are eight foot high and possibly with barbed wire on the top, means that you're serious about protecting like this one right here, right? You're serious about protecting your property. And uh, oftentimes those will go ahead and uh, deter even permanent intruder. So check this out. The bollards are usually small concrete pillars outside the building. 
sometimes you see like big flower pots and uh, huge boulders. And I think it was after the uh, Oklahoma City bombing that any federal building needed to have uh, bollards put in place uh, to make sure uh, that any sensitive buildings were protected. I believe that's what it was. Somebody could pick that up. So I mentioned this the other day, and uh, I'm just going to put it into the chat here again, that as far as lighting is concerned, unlikely you'll see that on the exam, but as far as lighting is concerned, any critical areas need to have an illumination that reaches at least eight feet high and two foot candles. Foot candle is a unit of light measured in the intensity of light. So uh, keep that in mind as you're going through and doing your CPTED to plan your, your facility protection. So uh, practicing defense in depth here can be quite complicated be quite complicated, right? You could have um, any type of breach alarms, on-premise security officers, server operations, gas-based fire suppression, redundant HVAC, UPS generators, seismically braced server racks. Woo! Sounds fancy. Biometric access and, and exit sensors, continuous video surveillance, electric motion monitors, maybe some sort of you know plenum space between the the server racks or something as well and the list goes on and on so there's quite a bit of uh, controls that we can put in place to make sure that we're uh, doing our security uh, for a facility and so it's kind of neat to to think about it uh, and break it down in a way that's meaningful there's basically four d's we typically say four D's, not to be confused with the number 40, but four D's. There's how do we deter, how do we deny, how do we detect, and how do we delay? I always think of, uh, you know, I've coached soccer uh, for a very long time, and, you know, my, uh, my kids play soccer, my youngest daughter does, she's on the middle school team, and then both my boys won. But I always think about, you know, with soccer, how do you delay somebody so you get the help, right? Uh, do, how do I deter them from doing what they want to do? And then ultimately, do I need to, to you know, tackle, make a tackle on them? Uh, not a slide tackle, just to, you know, tackle them hard. Do I need to, to push them around a little bit without using my hands or my elbows? Uh, just the rest of my body. And so, you know, I kind of think it, this is uh, oftentimes what we think about when we're playing soccer, right? We, we deter, we delay, we deny. And ultimately, you know, with our eyes, we see somebody coming um, in soccer at least. So same sort of thing, uh, you know, we, we, we figure out what our, what our boundary is. Um, you know, we, we figure out how we can actually deny access to that boundary. Um, Physical mechanisms would be like, you know, gates, guards, guns, fences, you know, uh, a moat <laughs> with with some alligators in it, maybe. Somebody mentioned a turret with some machine guns on the top. Yeah, whatever. Whatever way we can deny people from coming in. Uh, maybe we have fire-breathing dragons that are circling around as well. So, uh, you know, just some, some, some pretty good ideas if you're into the uh, medieval Game of Thrones kind of thing. But... Uh, in modern times, you know, motion detectors, uh, any type of sensors, and then uh, how can we delay ultimately? Um, you know, is there a, a dog? Do we have a, a man trap? Um, is there, uh, do we do we shoot him in the knee? I mean, what are, <laughs> what are some ways that we can delay people, right? Just off the top of the dome. Uh, you know, that's just really some of the things that you need to think of. Uh, a lot of times you'll see um, 
something like this implemented? What kind of physical security control? Remember, these are the controls. What kind of physical security control do you see right here? Which, which one is this? Put it into the chat window. Yeah, this would definitely be for cars, right? And yeah, obviously, if grandma's walking on this too, that'd be hard for her. Uh, toddler, yeah, getting paled. Um, yeah, and it's and it's unidirectional, right? So you can only go this way. Um, no. <laughs> if you go that way, you're in trouble, right? You want to go the other way. So you can only go the other way because these will, these, the spring will go down. Um, and, uh, but if you go backwards, you'll pop your tire. So yeah, this would absolutely, uh, delay someone, but also potentially uh, deter and ultimately I don't know if this is going to deny access to a facility, right? Somebody could still drive their car across there. Um, yeah, and they definitely would think twice before they're entering. But, you know, it it definitely, um, you know, would at least uh, deter, delay, maybe even deny. But, uh, yeah, at a high level, those are the ones. Okay? So there's two types of uh responses that we can have if there is some sort of electrical failure so think about this down in florida right now um i haven't checked the the hurricane in the last hour or so but it it looks like it's going to make a landfall at like midnight tonight um but you know think about this when when you know two hundred thousand people if it hits the tampa area two hundred thousand people which pinellas county um where clearwater and st pete is um, you know, that is the most populous county in the state of Florida where, you know, just east or I'm sorry, just west of, of Tampa. And so when, you know, 100,000, 200,000 people lose power um, and those facilities that are around there lose power and they don't have backups, what can happen? Well, there's a couple of different things that can happen. Um, one is a fail safe. And the idea is to fail open where people can actually exit the building. Uh, and then the other one is failed secure where it locks down the building. And typically where there is a uh, uh, electrical failures, usually there's either one or the other that happens here. Um, you know, the, the problem is, is if it, if it fails secure, uh, how are the people going to get out? And then an, uh, another thing is, if this fails open, what happens whenever everybody gets out and goes back to their houses and your facility is now left wide open? And so there's a couple of, of other alternatives to think about here, but at a high level, uh, know for your exam the difference between fail safe and fail secure. All right, let me jump into uh, another topic here equipment failure. And I, I mentioned the first day and again yesterday, and I'll say it again today, that uh, as we get closer to the end of the week, like after we get over this hump and start doing some of these other domains, there'll be topics that I've, that I've already covered, um, or we'll, we've been around those topics. And one of them is, you know, when equipment fails, what's the service level agreement with your, your vendor? And if you, uh, if you have that, you may be familiar with these terms right here. So you may see one question on your exam on the mean time to failure, mean time to repair, mean time between failure. Uh, these three, you may see one question, one out of the three may be on the question. Um, if you just take a look here at what this means, <laughs> you get it? Is it too late in the afternoon for me to make those types of jokes? Uh, so the mean time to failure is how long is the lifetime of the device given an operating environment? And so the first device failure we have listed right here, device repair is complete. And then the second device failure right here. And so the mean time to failure may be you know, 
here is day zero that you buy it. Um, let's say this is 730 days, so two years. Uh, mean time or the the first failure is 730 days. Well, in this particular case, the time to repair might be 90 days. Like this is the window. So you may be down 90 days for something. Uh, and if it immediately fails again, uh, you know, you could have all sorts of problems. But the time to repair is important because that's how long usually it, you're going to be down for unless, you know, typically, uh, like I know with our cellular devices, if you have uh, insurance, one thing that uh, Asurion will do if you're using Verizon is they'll send you a new device and um, that way you have no downtime with your with your cell phone. Um, but here is the first time that it failed. And then here's the second time that it failed. So then it, you come up with a mean time between failure uh, where, you know, this event happened on day 730. And then, you know, maybe this one happens, um, you know, day five or 1560, you know, something crazy way out there. And so you can calculate this MTVF based off of, you know, whatever the difference is between the two. And so that's typically how we deal with the reliability times. Um, you may have heard, and I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, since I've done training with people from Georgia Tech before, you guys are into all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, the Underwriters Laboratory, UL, is on a lot of electronic devices. In addition, JD Power and Associates. And then we have one here in town for military equipment called Wiley Cass. And so these three entities do a lion's share of testing on different uh, reliability times for a bunch of different vendors that are out there. So uh, that's important to, to think about whenever you're, you're looking into this.